tiny bit of irony that our next session, Disruptive Technologies and How They Address Wicked Problems in Rural India, have begun with some disruptive technology <laughs> that hasn't worked as well as we'd hoped because we have several virtual guests um, who we were hoping to get a, a, a while ago on Zoom but have taken a while to get on. So um, thank you for everyone's patience and thank you for everyone online for your patience as well. I would like to hand over this session to Swapno Agarwal, who you've already heard from, but just to remind you, he's the co-founder of Tuani Rural Information Systems, which create technology, technology solutions for the development sector. And without further ado, Swapno will handle this session and see how disruptive we can be. Thank you. Thank you, Lindy. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Swapno. Some of you may have heard in me in the first panel. Uh, feeling very grateful to invite uh, a lot of experts in this field. And this is one of the my favorite topics, wherein how do we see disruptive, or rather I would like to say it, emerging technology, uh, how they can solve our problems in the social sector. So I would like to invite the panelists who are there here. While we have Mr. Ashok joining us virtually, welcome, sir. We have Mr. Abhishant also joining us virtually. Uh, I would now like to invite uh, our experts, Mr. Anirban, Ms. Anaita, Ms. Pranjali, to the dice here, please. So I would like to begin the introductions. So we have with us Mr. Ashok joining us virtually. He's the former CEO to NASCOM, a uh, hardcore veteran in the field of technology and also I would say social and the development sector with over 40 years of experience. He has been an advisor and an evangelist in this field. Uh, welcome, sir. We have Ms. Anaida with us. She's a program officer at Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Uh, she has been instrumental in a lot of health and tech and other areas, policies with the government, her work at uh, Clinton Health Initiatives, Dimagi, uh, and others. We have Mr. Abhishant joining us uh, virtually. He's the founder of the FinTech Meetup, which is one of the India's largest uh, FinTech ecosystem. Uh, with a lot of unbanked population, and a lot of focus on digital financial services. It would be great to hear Mr. Abhishant's views. Then we have Mr. Anirban, who is currently the head for Qualcomm for the Social East, uh, Social East and India. He has over 20 plus years of experience again in the technology and the social sector space. Especially Qualcomm focuses a lot on Internet of Things and connected technologies. So it would be good to hear their views as well. We have Ms. Pranjali who is the business development head for non-profit verticals at Amazon Web Services, AWS, while our increasing uh, dependence on cloud services. It would be good to hear from Ms. Pranjali on how they are tackling, specifically working towards solution-based approach for the social sector and non-profits in India. Right. So now I would like to hand over uh, to Ms. Anaita, who will be the moderator for this session. Uh, thank you. Hope you have a very enriching and a lot of key, key takeaways from this session. Thank you. I hope I'm audible. Um, I'm really grateful for this panel for overcoming the tech challenges to talk about <laughs> disruptive technologies. I think it's a great start. Um, it also helps us um, simplify some of the challenges we're going to be talking about today in our heads to at least begin with. I thought today before we start I'll, st I'll talk about the smallest problem that we can solve for in the room which is that whenever we talk about rural communities and uh, marginalized communities and vulnerable populations, we always talk about them as a last mile problem to solve for. And somebody very recently told me that if you really want to start solving for it, talk about it as first mile. Um, so just keeping that at the center of the conversation today, I wanted to just start thinking about uh, some of the aspects that we need to solve for much more intentionally when we are thinking about rural communities and the kind of population we're talking about, it's really diverse. So just looking at a one size fits all solution is not gonna make a difference. When we are looking at these technologies, the use cases that we think about uh, 
sitting here as our vantage point versus actually interacting with these communities and what would actually be beneficial for them is something that I'd like to focus on as we talk about this. Um, I am going to try to do as best I can with this virtual scenario on in front of me and the in-person scenario in this room. Please do jump in any time when you want to come in, uh, but just, just know that we want this to be a much more free-flowing conversation. The questions are just to be able to pivot us uh, as we move along. Um, starting from Mr. Ashok, um, thank you for joining in. Uh, really appreciate you taking out the time. I thought we could start from the journey and the vantage point that you have being the CEO of NASCOM previously and now as a startup evangelist with Persistence, uh, Persistent Foundation as their advisor. Um, you worked at the intersection of tech, of social development, of diverse, diversity and inclusion. Given this journey that you've had and how you're thinking about the, you know, the, the journey we've already crossed with regard to tech in the Indian landscape over the last two decades and more, and now we're looking at these disruptive technologies, what do you see have been some of the things we've done right and some of the things we need to be more considerate about as we talk about serving communities in the marginalized populations and the vulnerable populations of the country? Over to you, sir. Thank you very much and uh, good afternoon to everybody. I would say that's a very interesting question because uh, whenever we talk about disruptive technologies or technology per se, what comes to our mind, top of our mind, anywhere in the world is India. And uh, if you think about really the, the overall tech industry, right, disruption is not new because we have been undergoing a lot of disruptions right from the 90s, then 2000, you had a Y2K, then again, we had the Lehman Brothers coming in and uh, quite recently, the COVID pandemic. Now, all throughout, the tech industry has actually emerged stronger and stronger. Now, having said that, I think this is a time for a paradigm shift for the social sector to adopt some of these practices what the tech industries have been doing for the last couple of decades. And uh, when I look at it, there are a lot of problems currently in India, right? I would say nine of the 10 most polluted cities in the world are in India. One third of the you know, children are malnourished, right? And we have a lot of population, probably I think close to about 250 million people entering the workforce in the year 2025 and already about 120 million and odd are looking for jobs. So these are all some of the problems which are facing India and more so in the rural setup what we speak. But having said that, one of the good things what has really happened over there is you know, I'll take some of the thematic areas because it's not possible to cover all these 17 SDGs. But some of the good areas, what is really happening is let's look at the area of agriculture, for example, right? And in this case, it's just not a social sector. Even the large corporates have actually entered the fray in trying to impact socially. And all of us know about the great story of ITC. After all, it has been, you know, even Howard has mentioned about the ITC's e-chopper um, success stories where they have impacted 35,000 and odd villages and more than 5 million villages have been impacted. But having said that, what is important to understand is what is the kind of technology which is happening and this technology is a leveler. Actually, it's a leveler because people who have to not, those who don't have are all actually coming onto the same platform, right? So that's one thing which is good. And we have seen other, you know, various other apps coming in from social entrepreneurs. For example, I just saw and read a company called Tushi Suchak, which incidentally is are all in local languages, just not in English. Now that's a very important aspect because even ITCs have gone into the local languages, they are in 10 states, right? So what is important is to understand and to communicate in the language what the rural, you know, folks understand. So that's one aspect is agriculture. The second one where I clearly see a success, but we can do more, is in the area of healthcare. When I look at healthcare, we all know that, you know, some of these places we have to travel of almost 27 kilometers to go to one primary healthcare centers, right? But having said that, Barak, for example, are now working with social entrepreneurs, right? And they're trying to see how exactly technologies like artificial intelligence is going to make an impact so that, you know, when there is less number of doctors and nurses, how can they impact them, right? And I've seen clearly some companies, um, I think it's called as um, one of the companies, you know, I was going through it, 
they are doing some amazing work periwinkle on cervical cancer using ai they are making some impact over there and so there are many such companies which are there but what is interesting is 5g which is going to come in a big way is going to make a lot of difference because you have a very high reliability 99.99% low latency and because of the fact that we we do have challenges in healthcare the last mile can be reached through telemedicine and that is going to make a huge success now you ask me the question is it successful the answer is no still we have a long way to go because 140 million people we have to support right it's not so easy to do it overnight right it takes time but i would say the directions are in the right way and it will happen and the last area which i would like to take is education because i've been working very closely in the area of education and thanks actually to the pandemic the whole as uh, i would say the ngo sector i think they are close to about 4450 startup in the tech in the in the in the country and we are the, i believe the second largest consumer of education and skilling upskilling and all those stuff in the country today i mean apart from us now what is very interesting is because of the covid pandemic every single company had to disrupt themselves looking at the hybrid way like what we are doing currently right this is the norm this is a new norm and this is what is very interesting so there was a lot of lms which is got created and lot of companies example i think i remember a company called idream now idream is using basically ai by means of which they are able to improve the progress of students right especially in the school k12 and now these are all some of these paradigm shifts which is happening by means of using technology you are able to make a huge difference and lastly because you mentioned about diversity equity inclusion and i've been there for a long time in this area this is one area where i clearly see technology being a major enabler because we believe that you know you got to keep people at the center use data and technology together but people are most important now in this case women are getting more empowered we have seen that clearly during the pandemic and after that they are you know the the self help groups the the social entrepreneurs and most most important is stem education right we are leading if you look at aisha report we are doing far ahead of the curve than many other countries in the world by having more stem girls in schools and colleges while it industry is an, is i would say an island of paradise we have 36% women in the it industry but there are a lot of things to learn from it by means of which they are actually taking a lot of initiatives for creating you know mentors by creating hands on experience by creating role models coming in from rural areas that's most important because you can't be having people only in delhi and bangalore and you know chennai and saying they're role models but they're role models in in small towns and cities and that is making a huge difference for women in the country while we have a long way to go it's still not working because please understand uh labor force participation female labor force participation is 10% down and our neighboring countries like sri lanka pakistan uh, and bangladesh have a higher female labor force participation but having said that there has been a good momentum happening at schools at colleges and vocational training and i would say that we are on the right path with a lot of support from government the civil societies and the corporate So thank you. I think I will. I will take more later on as we go forward. No, thank you. And you've you've brought us into many topics that we would like like to segue onto as well. So thank you for that. You you just summarizing some of uh, the conversation in terms of what I would request anyone to also speak about. Um, whether you talked about the large corporates trying to work in this space and trying to not just develop solutions and applications at the last mile, but actually think about it in a much more integrated manner. Whether it's five G, whether it's AI. um something very close to my heart women in the workforce and designing keeping them at the center of it and having them in the room while you're designing um so just coming to you i think with qualcom uh, and the qualcom wireless reach initiatives that you've been working on on education livelihood healthcare uh, you'd mentioned that technology first is a principle for you uh but you're also thinking about how to be able to bridge the digital divide and the gender digital divide much more effectively and intentionally as you work in India and in Southeast Asia as well so if you could share some light on what your journey has been around this and how you're thinking about overcoming some of the challenges risks and inherent biases as we use some of these technologies going forward
So um, I work for uh, Wireless Reach, which is uh, Qualcomm's corporate social responsibility focused on technology. We are actually, uh, we actually lead, as Anaita said, we lead technology first. We align ourselves very strongly with Qualcomm technologies and look at programs that align with our, uh, I would say, government and business interests. And that actually helps us a lot because, you know, that makes, that actually gets the attention from the company, which, as you know, sometimes, you know, uh, CSR programs don't get that attention. So that is, uh, that is where we are a little fortunate about that. Uh, this, uh, the wireless reach program is a global program and, you know, it's been in existence for about 15 years. Uh, one of our oldest programs in India has been the Fisher Friend program. As you know, marine fishers, you know, marine f fishers is one of the, they are, they are, it's one of the most risky professions, you know, even though uh, the number of marine fishers uh, are not much, they are about something like 15 to 16 lakhs, depending on uh, who you talk to. And the number of active fishers are also less, but small scale fishers, you know, they face the problems of livelihoods. As you know, you know, I mean, like uh, fish catches are declining, uh, they they are uh, they face you know uh, poor weather conditions cyclones uh, heavy wind speeds uh, wave uh, you know high waves and this is only exacerbating you know with climate change as all of us know that you know this is exacerbating so what what we did is that you know uh, and you know, government actually had set up a really stand world class infrastructure like you know the Indian National Center for Ocean Information uh, systems and you know if I mean you know I would really like that uh, people should Google it and all that it's really a world-class infrastructure but what actually happens is that and in India not just I mean uh, Mr. Ashok mentioned about agriculture and you know we have a very large agricultural research but lab to land is something very difficult to uh, to happen and uh, we were actually very fortunate that you know we partnered with MS Swaminathan Research Foundation uh, Professor Swaminathan, you know, bless him, he's going to be 97 on 9th of August. He's the founder of this uh, organization and he, you know, he believed in lab to land and that's how the Green Revolution happened. And it's very interesting that, you know, even though he was an agricultural scientist, but he felt coastal system research was as important. And, uh, you know, after the terrible tsunami, we partnered with them to kind of, you know, create solutions for marine fishers. And uh, then, you know, we, we uh, in 2013, we moved it to 3G, when 3G came to India, and we provide all kinds of information that a fisher needs to fish safely in the sea, which is, you know, information on where the fish catches. And here, you know, Indian National Center for Ocean Information Services, they actually provide potential fishing zones, you know, through remote sensing. And uh, they provide information on, you know, sea conditions, wind speeds, wave heights, and we provide that to uh, fishers using a mobile app and they are able to fish safely. We have about, you know, 95,000 fishers who are using this app. Uh, we also, uh, Mr. Ashok spoke about agriculture and uh, we work with an organization called Watershed Trust in uh, Pune, which through, uh, through them we have developed a mobile app and uh, and, you know, this app provides information that a farmer wants and it's actually customized for the farmer because, you know, in the sense that, you know, he, he says, okay, this is where I am, you know, this is my farm, this is the soil condition, this is the crop that I have sown. And then based on that, you know, based on the local conditions, we provide him advisories, we provide him market prices. And here again, it has been quite successful. We have about 80,000 farmers who use it. Uh, let me just very quickly move on to, I mean, since this is on technology, uh, you know, for a very long time, we have worked with this organization called Nextleaf Analytics. And uh, some time back, you know, and I know that, you know, climate change, women is, uh, is a theme of this conference. So as before our, you know, before the Ujwala Yojana, as we know that, you know, there was the use of, uh, I would say, traditional biomass was quite used in cooking. And uh, there is always this thing of moving them to using clean cook stoves it's very difficult to track clean cooking. So what we did was that, you know, we put an IoT sensor on a clean cook stove and that would actually track when the, uh, when the person is cooking. 
and we provided them you know uh, incentives using you know i know abhishant was uh, worked in vodafone m pesa so we provide them credits using you know m pesa uh, probably you know i i probably interacted with abhishant during that time uh, so the same technology that is used to track you know uh, temperature of of cook of cook stoves is also used to track you know temperature of ref of refrigerators that that you know are used to store vaccines and uh, we again worked with uh, st you know state of art non profit next leaf analytics an organization that we were actually the first funders and they developed this technology where you know they actually use uh, bluetooth and uh, and you know uh, 2g technology to track temperatures of vaccine and then transport it, you know and then then you know uh, send it to a remote uh, remote server and this way you know health technicians can get alerts that okay uh, you know when the let's say there is a refrigerator breakdown there is no uh, there is no uh, power and you know so the health technician gets alerts that okay now there is there is you know the the temperature has moved up and now he has to do something to rectify it uh, we have a whole host of such solutions you know whether it's in telemedicine whether it's use of education use of vr uh, mr ashok was very kind enough to mention 5g something that you know qualcomm is is leading we we have a lot of technologies on on 5g and of course you know the 5g rollout in the country has been very successful we do hope you know there are uh, use cases of use of telemedicine and um, and uh, education tele education using 5g in the future so i'll stop now i know that we have a distinguished panel and i would like to give no thank you and and thank you for talking about some of these examples i think the example around the cold chain equipment yeah. management is an at scale example uh, where it's being used extensively across the public health system in the country um and i'll with with the mpesa segue i'll probably move to abhishant and talk about how starting from how upi has revolutionized a lot of what's happening in india and now other countries as well um and building on that protocol based architecture we have uhi coming in on the agri side we have similar architecture on the education side as well but coming back to your commendable journey as a fintech evangelist uh the work that you're doing with uh fintech uh, meetup as well i think if you could share some of your observations um for driving inclusive Uh, solutions for a diverse country like us when it comes to finance um and also how fintech solutions using blockchain ai uh financial inclusion in rural areas have been able to and can make more um you know advancements one small question that i just wanted to add here was that you know we've seen the government actually making a lot of effort uh to be able to drive policies to be able to support such work going forward from your perspective how can government some of the large corporates some of the npos also play a more uh, intentional role as we take this forward in the rural communities uh, with a more targeted approach to be able to you know get into tribal communities for example to be able to actually effectively help them leverage it if at all or marginalized communities and vulnerable populations so over to you abhishan thanks a lot uh i think and uh, good to see you anirban after long uh, so thanks uh, for this conversation uh, to drf and uh, everyone out there uh, sorry for not being there in person i traveled a lot so i thought it's better to be away and be digitally present uh, in some occasions uh, so when we talk from a, from our nation point of view our nation is large enough and So frankly the way we look at our nation we look at it in four lenses one portion of our nation is something closer to singapore or hong kong wherein you have a population of 1 and 1/2 to 2 crores which essentially lives in the similar manner in which singapore hong kong lives mm -hmm. and this is the population which works lives in a manner in fashion anyone in the world after that you have a population which is anywhere from 8 to 10 crores or something like that which is the next level this next level is where you have most of the financial products targeted at this is the population which is the carded population if you look at the people in this room they are representative of that population uh, they will have possibly four to five cards in their pocket which will include credit and debit this population is representative of uh, europe uh, to me 
the third set of population is somebody who is uh, is a group which is a cohort of 20 to 25 odd crores this is uh, what many describe as missing middle or above middle below middle wheresoever one can fit in their middles definition and this possibly to an extent represents some part of asia it represents uh, some of the eastern european countries and so on and so forth and after this what you have close to a billion population or so is where most of the financial products and other value chains are frankly not targeted at so uh, the conversation possibly that we are having and with with zooming down on that base we are talking about potentially 80 to 90 crore people who do not have the targeted value chains at their end first set of attempts which happened on that there's those attempts happened in late 90s and early 2000s when first set of entrepreneurs came in financial service and i'm restricting my, myself to financial services the first set of entrepreneurs who came in financial services as domain in late 90s and early 2000s these are basically microfinance entrepreneurs these were people who built india's first microfinance value chains these were people who got motivated by what they saw in terms of unus model of of jlg and they brought in that model from an india market point of view this was also the time when for the first time I and some of these pieces might not be a bit more technical for your audience Uh, this is the time when fldg came into existence uh, which essentially ensured the thriving of indian uh, micro finance value chain so and today what you see as success of many and it happened just 15 days back for another micro finance entrepreneur which is govind singh who started his micro finance organization from varanasi and which became a bank and had an ipo just few days back so this is how we have seen the trajectory the 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 interestingly the first set of microfinance entrepreneurs also came at the same time when when frankly a large wave of tech, uh, tech entrepreneurs came because of y2k which was around 2000s period or so but these people were focused on ground and were driving physical led development versus the others came in uh, from a digital led adoption curve point of view the next point in india's journey essentially came in the mid 2000s or and sorry around 2010 onwards when you had uh, imps which came into existence imps is the essentially the bedrock on which uh, upi works and this essentially from where when shamla gopinath launched it in december 2010 it is from there you started building a platform which essentially allowed us to transact today what you have is essentially in our case globally tech led developments or essentially in within financial services tech led developments have seen seen three kind of models one is a model which is regulatory intervention led model other is a model wherein the cooperative federalism comes into picture and third is a model wherein the market forces take care of it in our case what we have seen from a model point of view is a regulatory intervention led model it's a model wherein the regulator essentially regulator and i'm involving government into that it is uh, the the upa government which essentially led the formation of npci uh, the uh, the formation of aadhar and what you see today's infrastructure of uh, financial tech which essentially driving india is largely something which got its foot in the late 2000s and 2010s now all of this was got built solved for this 40 crore population to a large extent in an assisted format at this point of time it is solving for your rural on rural population in form of aadhar enabled payment systems in form of biometric enabled value chains and so and so forth and all of this is an assisted value chain so what you fundamentally are talking about is this for an 80 to 90 crore population you have an assisted technology led intervention which essentially will drive change at their end for a foreseeable future you won't be able to address them with from a pure tech point of view if we want to believe in that we are living in fools paradise this population will require handholding and financial services which essentially involves dealing with people's money should come with consent driven by understanding and appreciation of the product and should find value ease and convenience of delivery to them 
all of this put together misses the point of they being able to fundamentally appreciate the product it is there potentially assisted value chains will drive some of them towards the change how they can be driven one of the fundamental pieces of them to be driven is where uh, anirban and organizations like they are coming to picture in form of supporting this in the csr framework somewhere we potentially need a a campaign like pulse polio immunization campaign which essentially went door to door down ground to ground village to village and then enabling people to understand appreciate five digital transaction in their daily life and if we can do a pulse polio like campaign for five digital transactions in their daily life we will be solving large extent for india's tech led interventions on financial services these five could include your how to how basic simple things how to pay your electricity bill how to book a railway ticket how to most of the households even in the 80 crore 100 crore population you will find them having dth recharges and so and so forth if you solve for five basic transactions you will solve for it we have thrown a lot of money as a nation down the drain in csr in the name of 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 financial uh, inclusion based drive that money has simply gone down the drain what we need to move that to is digital financial transactional literacy so that people understand what for they should use that and what for they should do intervention for these are my initial comments and uh, thanks a lot for bearing with me abhishan before i turn to pranjali one quick follow up on the fintech meetup work that you're doing um through some of the your parting thought around digital financial transaction literacy are you thinking about some of that through that work how are you trying to bridge this gap uh, or how do you think the community is coming together if at all not to put you in a spot no largely uh, i refrain from talking about what we do uh, for the simple reason that i think our community knows us well enough uh, just to put that in perspective we do something absurdly unique and you would have i and this is cliche to say but you have never heard of anything what we do uh, we fundamentally drive change from ground uh, we undertake a 10000 km road journey across india every single year we have done that for last 5 years uh, i have personally lived 350 plus days of my life in last 5 years on road including both covid years we visit 19 cities we we stay in 20 plus villages we meet with 400 fintech entrepreneurs hundreds of common individuals we conduct village training programs and multiple others to essentially appreciate understand and make intervention interventional efforts in digital financial value chain uh, as part of that we do certain things in form of our social responsibility as tfm we are fundamentally venture operators or you can say venture investors we invest in fintech startups that's fundamental job at rn however uh, we undertake this road journey to understand and appreciate market better you can call it as an intersection between the romanticism of che guevara's motorcycle diaries and manmohan singh's market economics not the current market economics no thank you for sharing and the reason i was asking was that as i moved to pranjali who uh, leads the npo work at aws in india um we were talking about partnerships ecosystem creation and the complexities around it to be able to inform the work that we do to be able to serve rural communities to be able to drive these solutions which are inclusive in design approach from a usability perspective from an ease of being able to access perspective while we think about it with an assisted model or a digital lens uh for some of the communities we're looking to serve so pran you just wanted to hear from you on how you're thinking about this in the aws construct how some of this has changed with the npos that you're working with um and how, what do you think are going to be potential challenges that you'll have to overcome as these disruptive technologies come into play uh, as you work with these organizations sure thank you anita so um, so anita before i come to your question i would just like to uh, focus a little bit about on aws is actually doing this work in the sector right how we this sector being there for so long and you know 2 million registered and non registered non profits right now to serve the people in india in the underprivileged sector we don't see a lot of technology uh, organization for profit or not profit coming along to be there right and 
how we say that the changing the narrative into aid building more trust and partnership as we also talked about it in our previous session could change the whole ecosystem out of, of it, right? And we are seeing many uh, things. Um, I won't say, like, I think in last three to four years when pandemic hit us, it brought us together as a community. And we saw that technology can be used as a lever to uh, reach to the masses, to actually enable the last mile execution much more better than doing it in individual one-to-one -one model, right? And um, how AWS is trying to participate is in that, that we are one of the only organization, what we are seeing in the vertical, who has a dedicated team to work on that, right? And it makes a lot of difference. Because we are right now working in a pyramid model where we are using AWS as a platform, the building blocks we have, to help the uh, people who are helping those people forward, right? So we are actually reaching to few who are reaching to more and reaching to more there and reaching for the last mile or the first mile execution, as you just said. And there are many use cases on how we are doing it, how technology is actually enabling that. Um, and one big change which is coming into the market is that cloud has reduced the entry barrier for the technology uh, these smaller organizations used to face, right? So for using the technology earlier, you have to have the infrastructure, you have to have the in there, uh, the money which is there, right? But that entry barrier has been lowered because with cloud, you don't have to have the upfront thing which being there. And AWS Cloud itself to be the pay-as-you-go model as we have, right? And we have, we are seeing collaboration uh, with the other organization as well, like NASCOM Foundation. We do the big tech soup uh, program together and we do provide the credit to the initial level organization who want to use the technology, right? So it is getting there, we are getting there, and there are many much more things when we talk about the, uh, you know, the partnership building there. The social incubators are the next new example where we are seeing that they are having the cohort of 60, 70 in one, uh, in one cohort where they're actually leveraging technology to have the social initiative startups, right? And we are working with many such startups right now and AWS wants to work in a model where we are reaching out in the terms of technology, in the terms of uh, having those building blocks being together. Thank you for sharing. And just building on the point of collaboration that you mentioned with the NASCOM Foundation as well, Mr. Ashok, I thought we could probably also touch upon some of the work that you've seen with these emerging technologies uh, to promote inclusive growth in rural communities, especially with a focus on empowering youth. I think one of the one of the key areas within the rural communities as well is to how do we tap into being able to make these technologies more friendly, affordable for them to become the champions and the role models that you were talking about and you alluded to earlier. So just wanted to get a sense from you and then I'll probably go to Abhishan to talk about how they are tapping into the youth of the country to be able to drive the fintech revolution and you, you spoke about the example from Varanasi as well. So maybe it'll be good to hear from you as well. Over to you Ashokji. Yeah, thank you. So one of the things which is really happening is the slow but gradual shift from metro to non-metros. And if you look, really look at it, currently it's like a triangle, but shortly we'll get into a diamond-shaped, uh, you know, a demographic dividend, so to speak. While the rich will become richer by five to ten percent, the middle class will increase. And what is important is the the lower income group, okay, they will be increasing by about 12% in the year, by year 2030. Now, these are all enough data and statistics coming out from various sources. Now, what is happening is the shift is going to go from metros to tier three cities and beyond, tier three cities and beyond. Now, this is going to make a huge change in A, the way we work, the way we live, in rural um, setups. And one of the key things will be obviously be technology because technology is going to become a big leveler. But having said that, there is a big roadmap, right? We have a couple of years to go to reach that particular level. Now here, what I see is some of the things which really is happening and a, a, a big shift which is happening is obviously government's new NEP policies, which has come out, right? It is helping 
the youths to really ensure that they are basically getting trained in vocation because it's only in india if you look at it that they demand that you have to have graduates you know 10 plus 2 plus 3 and then they get employment in the organized sector that's one major shift which is going to happen as we go forward the second thing which is i clearly see is the civil societies the ngos today now ngos today currently if you look at let's say disability for example right you find that majority of the ngos are actually clustered in bangalore chennai hyderabad you know delhi and so on but there's a huge market data clearly shows though it's a bit outdated 2011 census 69 percent of the disability actually are from rural areas so where are they they have to come to city to get trained by the ngos and get employed here now that whole aspect will change so the shift is already happening you're finding companies like zoho for example right they are working in villages you find like where i am an advisor persistent they are going into 18 cities nagaro is already gone to 21 locations and 18 or 21 locations Almost all the firms today, big or small, medium or large, all are going and shifting their bases to where their talent lies. And talent is not necessary in the metros. That's one aspect. Second aspect, what I clearly see is that the rural today are as good as you and me, except that they may not be able to speak English like what we are doing currently. And the whole paradigm is because of generative AI which is coming, right? And you also saw already a success which came in times recently about a Bangalore-based firm, I think Kiara or somebody. Karya. Sorry, yeah. Who's working today in rural Karnataka and they're taking and making the system learn Kannada in the local dialect. Now, that is the paradigm shift which is going to happen. So, so you know, uh, basically, if you want to basically try to treat tuberal, tuberal cases, it's impossible unless and until you know English and you are able to chat with them. With all this paradigm shift happening in technology, you'll find that they will be able to communicate in the local language. NLP and other things are going to happen. So that's one shift which is happening. The second thing which is really happening is, what I clearly see is the government of India in what I call it open digital health ecosystem. Right? Now that is a good transformation which is really going to happen because if you look at beyond, I'm from Karnataka, so I say beyond Mysore, you don't have good hospitals. You go to Kur, you go to Madikare, you go to other places, they have to come down, right? You have a challenge, right? And, and they always have to fly down. But luckily, of course, again, technology is playing a role. I would say that with 5G and, you know, Apollo, I think, has done something in, in Calcutta where they use 5G and they're able to ensure that the last mile issue or the golden hour is is sorted out because of 5G, okay? But having said that, the rural today are very keen, A, to get trained and work in the place from where they come from, the sons of the soil, so the daughters of the soil, they want to work there. And I have a number of examples where I can give. Uh, there's a company called Next Wealth. They are operating in half a dozen cities, rural cities like Krishnagiri, Salem and all. And today they are actually recruiting people from the local area giving them job and 70 percent of their staff are women there's another company called info media which is based in bangalore but they are in nagpur they are in hyderabad they are in you know krishnagiri and so on 30 percent of their staff are from disabled sector and 90 percent of their workforce are from the underrepresented communities the attrition level is low they don't quit they are very happy and they make the career growth and by giving employment to one you are actually supporting four you know, your families are getting supported. So I would say that the rural India is looking forward to ensure that they are able to absorb and embrace these new technologies, which could be 5G, it could be AI, it could be anything because they don't understand all the stuff, right? And you saw that article, it says, I only understand, okay, Google. That's what they said, you know, okay, Google. But the whole aspect will change once it comes in Canada or Tamil or Telugu, you know, whatever it is going to be happen. I'm sure the Google, the Amazons and all will change. And this is going to make a difference for the rural masses in the country. No more you'll find migration. Migration was the biggest challenge we had, right? And because of that COVID, if you remember, everybody went back. Now they're slowly changing. We are going there where the market is and where the, um, where the talent is and where, again, Huge, huge opportunities exist 
for just not you know um, in uh, let's say in uh, uh, areas like it it could be industries it could be manufacturing it could be agriculture it could be the supply chain the whole aspects are going to change and technology will be a big enabler and people need not be graduates that's a one thing which i am very happy about nep they need not be graduates they can be 10th standard pass 12th standard but and i see google doing it google world over they don't bother about what education you are having right they look at it basic attitude and we are able to learn they are able to absorb them and they are able to train them and i think slowly but surely companies like zoho have already shown that they they are taking talent from villages and training them and actually making them employable and actually um, increasing the economy of that particular city or the place they are coming from the community they are coming from so i see that i am a very i would say positive in this approach i see the civil society the government the corporates and the social entrepreneurs need not be ngos all getting to and of course academic because academics too play a role they will all of them when they get together it can be a very very formidable force for a country like us and thank you thank you for sharing and uh, abhishant i'll come to you with this one thought that we need the people who we are designing these solutions to be in the room so that they are informing what the requirement is um and we heard that in the first panel itself and very very happy to see the optimism um of the glass half full and the glass half empty i wanted to talk to abhishant about which is that when you are going into these communities and you're doing your road shows every year and you're thinking about the the population that is still underserved where it's either an assisted model or fidgetal or some combination of it and the challenges we had heard earlier as well how do you think about um solving for some of this whether it's generative ai and the risk involved from a biases or a hallucination perspective uh whether it is also streamlining the the use cases it should be used for and not over indexing on it uh just yet um just wanted to hear your thoughts about that i'm not sure uh, whether your audience will be able to understand what i'm going to say in next few lines but i'll still say that because the flavor of it will be lost if i'll not say it in that manner zarurat jo hai zarurat hai guftugu band na ho guftugu band na ho baat se baat chale subah tak shaam mein mulaqat chale हम पे हंसती हुई ये तारों भरी रात चले वट डज दैट इट मीन्स सेंशली फंडामेंटली इज दैट वॉट वी लैक इज आर एबिलिटी टू अंडरटेक अ कॉन्वर्सेशन विद द पॉपुलेस विच इज मिसिंग बाय सिटिंग बाय बीइंग देयर एंड बीइंग विद देम दैट्स व्हाट वी लैक एंड बिकॉज वी लैक दैट and because we are not in a position to do that guftugu that indian coffee house style long conversations which are not went with the idea of finding a solution that boss main jo hai delhi se aaya hu main mumbai se aaya hu main tumhare jeevan ki sari samasyaen solve kar dunga not going with that attitude and having a open conversation wherein you can talk for hours at length and invest time and effort in uncovering and peeling the onion rather than trying to go with a questionnaire and trying to find an answer for that so unfortunately we go with questionnaires and we therefore don't find the solutions for that and therefore we look at it as half glass full or half glass empty and not the glass the water that i need that's it i need half glass only yaar kya karunga full ka that's enough for me so if i have glass is the only thing i need that's it we should be referring to that as a conversation now specifically coming from a i'll give you an example and you will appreciate why i said this and what we miss uh around 2 3 years back it was uh, i think uh, 2020 uh, we did 2020 yatra uh, some time in november december and in november december i was in 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 one part of maharashtra there is a village called parli and i was there i was spending night over there in that village and while being there 
uh one of the uh, one of the uh, the social organizations which works with uh, ngo over there grassroots organization they came back said uh, remember you had talked about to us that we should create a app for our community and so and so forth and all of that look we have created something like this and i thought i would like to show it to you first before we uh, launch it to larger ngo community in maharashtra i said okay fine let us look at it i looked at that app i just looked at it more from a tech lens point of view or its ui ux point of view and all of it and all of it and i said yeah theek lag rahi it is looking good and so on and then uh, that banda uh, then there were 10 women also sitting in a cohort who were basically the women we had met in past few years and they have now graduated to a level wherein these women had become uh, from uh, a information disseminator to uh, rural village entrepreneurs now when these women saw that app uh, they started doing murmur among themselves and then uh, as the murmur grew i asked the gentleman ki bhai kya hua what is the point and he he asked one of the ladies to stand up and said and that lady spoke in marathi i'm just putting it in english for you she said that this lady doesn't look like us doesn't speak our language and uh, and i was not guessing it and even the person who was from their community could not guess it and guess what the reason why that was because the way they had portrayed the women in that app is not the manner in which maharashtrian women will wear a sari what we realized is, is that the manner in which that women was portrayed that app and its ui ux was built by a bengali gentleman who essentially portrayed a women from rural bengal not a women from rural maharashtra so the the demeanor and the way she looked was different similarly the language was essentially a translation from english to marathi so what what was a miss was transliteration which is you you not just convert it into local language but you bring local ethos local dialect and local and essentially colloquialism to it so what we fundamentally miss when we go out and talk from a rural populist point of view from a tech point of view and otherwise we essentially try to impose what we understand how we see and our own value chains to where they are what they know and what they understand from a rural tech interventions point of view at this point of time frankly we'll have to look at india into and and i'm only referring to financial services i don't uh, appreciate any other piece so we'll restrict to that uh, from an india point of view what we miss at this point of time is we are killing certain institutions who were bedrock of supporting the last mile rural value chains i'm not sure when last time people in the room went to a rural environment but in rural environment in banking we had something which is known as regional rural banks jinko kshetriya gramin bank kaha jata hai these were basically institutions along with cooperatives along with patpadi sansthas and others these were institutions which were created in 70s and 80s for the purpose of serving the you may call it first mile last mile this this it is a deprived mile whatever we may want to call it that deprived mile to whom these people were addressing these were essentially one branch one branch manager one cashier and one staff manned population which was serving these communities the what has happened is is that due to lack of resources lack of support lack of last mile coverage these institutions are slowly and steadily dying and the populace to whom they are serving the populace still lies there and that populace is aging in my in my home state of uttarakhand i see number of ghost towns and others where in only either elderly women elderly parents or essentially retired from army uh, families are left and not more not less than that and that populace which needs to be intervened and 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 worked upon from there that frankly an urban tech intervention guy will not do it because it is not financially viable 
in such cases it is where the state led interventions of patient capital come and it is the patient capital which comes from state led interventions is going to be one of the drivers of reviving these financial institutions to be able to serve that populace rightfully unless and until or the other framework that potentially can help is to look at the microfinance from a thought process point of view fundamentally differently and in that case also you will require access to capital which comes in form of again from a state point of view as a patient capital which can support some of the experimentations in that pure on microfinance entrepreneur will also not go down that lane because the cost of serving these people is too high to be done on a stand alone basis so do we have solution yes we do have certain solutions but both of them require interventions from a state point of view pure entrepreneurial spirit will essentially not solve for it and tech cannot solve for it well, thank you for sharing um i work in up bihar so a lot of my work is with the frontline workers and uh, of course we've heard of these different apps that are being you know developed to digitize and it was mentioned in the previous panel as well the other day i was on the field and we were talking to a couple of asha's uh, accredited social health workers and uh, she had demoed this application because there was a state team and she had said i use this and i do this and when i t told her can you show it to me she said it's just syncing we just translating uh, the conversation it's just uh, i think it's not working right now some problem with sync i said it's an off offline application just log in log out you'll be able to show it and she just moved away so once everybody wa wa walked away i asked her so you know what's the problem show it i opened it it started working so i said chalo show how do you enter data into this um she said um uh, something so i said okay get me your register maybe i can like help you navigate this she got her uh, asha diary is uh, something they use so she got her asha diary so i said show me the records here so she started showing so i said so point to the one which you have entered here which i'm showing on the app now then she just looked around nobody was around she said i can't write i can't use digital my son fills the register for me my husband has started helping me with the phone and that's very telling of how we actually went about recruiting this was not a requisite for them right there was a certain literacy level that was expected and that's it you are a part of the community please come and be an asha and these are the jobs that you are responsible for and now we are just dumping application so uh, completely suffice to say that we did not solve for her problem we only added more um and now she's having to hide and use and leverage her family members in this regard but but moving on from there just, uh, sorry yeah sorry but just for that and when you stated that i got reminded of one more piece which is a uh, few years back nabard asked me uh some support in stating that yaar uh, we had launched something in tamil nadu uh, and it is not working can you essentially help us understand why is it not working and uh, i said fine let me see why is it not working and i went and uh, i went there and i went to uh, uh, this uh, this place which was around 60 to 70 kilometers from chennai i went there and saw the app i saw the app it was an, so basically nabard supports number of uh, uh, say cooperative institutions and this was one of the cooperative institution to whom they were supporting i saw the app and uh, they said ki yaar this app is made by xyz institution i don't want to name them they said that this app is made by xyz institution uh, but somehow the adoption is not there i went there i looked at it and i looked at it and the first the, the first instance i looked at it i said yaar how the hell you cannot see it why it will not work in rural tamil nadu which is 670 kilometers from chennai you are deploying an application which is entirely in english understand the plight of the person who moves out of an airport in chennai and finds it difficult to give direction to the driver to tell that driver ki boss wo kahan pahunchna hai aur hamesha that uh, india ke jhande wale khamba hota hai everyone comes there and anyone who understand uh, doesn't understand tamil and there you are propagating an application which is made in english and has no meaning and the so the, there was only one person in that district central cooperative bank who knew how to operate it and is the one who was trained by that entity on how to run it that's it and why that happened 
The reason why that happened is this, that in many of these cases, when we do such interventions, we make it so pathetically cheap for somebody to build it, that the incentive to do it right is not there. The person told me that the agency which they had involved, they had a budget of 8 lakh rupees only. In 8 lakh rupees ke budget, mein, they were supposed to do everything. So whatever shit they could bring, they brought that shit. So if you look at these interventions, as a medium of PR and 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 value and and promulgating that ways and not frankly building value to it, you will build crap. And the problem is that the rural janta over there has no voice to be heard that you got crap for me, and you end up doing that. That's not the way you solve for it. No, thank you for sharing. And I'm also realizing that this time we've been able to have the virtual participants uh, actually participate more. Uh, and and I'm not done justice on this side. So I wanted to come to you, Pranjali, and then to you as well, Aran, one around, you know, you, you were, when we were talking before the session started, you were mentioning about uh, trying to build, and it also came up in the conversation earlier, trying to build, figure out how to build sustainable business models for these providers to start actually unlocking the potential of what they can do and you know scale some of these initiatives in the rural communities because typically it doesn't just it doesn't work for them right so when you're thinking about that what are the challenges you've seen when you you know they're leveraging these technologies when you are partnering with them it would be great to hear sure. from you so um, when we go into this conversation anaita and i'll be very open and frank so the first thing they ask us about okay how much credits we are getting right and this is where we we keep ourselves back and we say we bring technology, we do have a CSR foundation, they help, they serve, but we are a technical arm of Amazon Web Services, right? But having said that, we understand the vertical, we understand how this works. Let us bring you the sustainable technology, right? And I think that is the, le that is the thing which we need to work more on, right? When we are giving the technology, when we are giving the solution, it has to be sustainable, self-sustainable. In many conversation, like, uh, you know, we would do metaverse conversation. We would do many other conversation, like Bangalore Airport, we have uh, created our metaverse. Or you go to Delhi Airport, you have used Digiata, right? If you bring, you say, these are the high level technology. Can we bring it to a nonprofit? We can. We definitely can. A philanthropy fund, we can fund them for how long? Six months, 12 months, two years? What after that? Why don't we bring them something which they can self sustain? on the longer and the longer term of that, right? And these are the challenges we are facing because the lens needs to be changed, the idea needs to be changed. And on top of that, and uh, you know, we were talking about this, I was sitting with one of the social incubator and they said a brilliant thing to me that the brightest mind in the industry is working on the secondary problem right now, right? You talk about edtechs, Vedantus, Baijus, they have phenomenal reach, a B2C model where they have created some platform where students are learning from home, they are learning this, they are learning that. What about the students who really doesn't have the means to learn? Why can't these people work on that? Why, they do, why are they not creating the platform for these people, for the underprivileged students who needs the employability, who needs the skill? They are the first earners in their family, right? When the, the big funds like Tata's and Cortex, they are working on the skill building, the vocational part of it, and using the technology for it, they are not using the, fi the finest part in the industry which is available, right? We are trying to build that gap. We are actually trying to create a community which is a tech community, which is not looked as somebody who's looking for credit, somebody who's looking for, you know, to just do it for a shorter period of time. We are here, we want to build a community like Dhwani, who only work for nonprofit as a vertical. We want to have more social startups work in an incentivized model, and the brighter and the brightest mind come and work on these problems on that. Thank you for sharing. And uh, I will probably just segue into what you were talking about earlier because there's a question for you, and I'm just trying to read it. Can the person who wrote this question please uh, just stand up and we can pass the mic? saying uh, can be used by large uh, marine uh, private operators to catch fishes than by the Indian, I mean the smaller fisher folks. 
So, how will, I mean this will adversely affect the smaller fisher folk. So, I mean uh, the, the app that you yeah. are saying, so I mean how, uh, you, your comments, I mean this will, yeah. since it will ad adversely affect the smaller uh, fisher folks. So, yeah. your comments. I, actually, I mean uh, the question that you have asked is, is quite complex in nature. So, as you know there are various types of fishing which happens. And you know, we are actually, uh, we are, so one of the, uh, one of, I would say a path breaking thing that Indian National Center for Ocean Information Services, INCOIS has done, is that they actually provide uh, information on potential fishing zones. And these are, you know, and that is also that makes it very environmentally sustainable because, you know, these fishing zones are basically, you can say, you know, surface fishes, not bottom fishes. So this you, you catch using sustainable technologies and not trawl technologies. Also you mentioned, I mean you are, you understand that the domain very well. Even though I think about 70% of fishers are small scale fishers, but most of the outputs are captured by larger fishers. In India we actually don't have, you know, the industrial scale fishing which is actually very well known outside. And this information actually is very beneficial for small scale fishers also. For example, like, you know, it has information on wind speeds, wave heights, which, uh, you know, which actually empowers them to go out when the fishing is well. A uh, lot of these fishers, you know, they use things like gill nets, which help them, you know, take advantage of these potential fishing zones, which are about 50, 60 kilometers ahead. Uh, these actually discourage trawl fishing. And uh, also, the, so these are ways which actually they empower small scale fishers. They actually create a more level playing field for small scale fishers as compared to larger industrial fishing. Thanks so much for the question. Anubai, one question to you would be uh, following up on what Pranjali was also talking about that when you are using some of the technologies that we yeah. were earlier talking about, um, in rural India and, and you know, you're trying to be able to bridge the digital divide and you alluded to that a little bit. From your perspective as Qualcomm supports some of these initiatives, what are those sustainability factors that you're trying to keep in mind from mm -hmm. an implementation standpoint? Um, yeah. It would be good to hear. So, uh, this is actually, you know, very interesting and, uh, you know, Abhishant actually said something, you know, which is patient capital. And uh, I feel that, you know, uh, we actually have we have actually been with the Fisher Fen program for something like 14, 15 years, and uh, information is not sustainable in India. Whether it is our farming program uh, or the fishing program, you know, you cannot make money on uh, providing information to I think anybody. I mean, like you know, none of us pay for any kind of information. Uh, it's very surprising because you know, I mean, like. In, in fisheries, actually, you know, the, fisher, the fishers make windfall gains. So we have case studies where, you know, fishers who have followed the potential fishing zone advisories, they have made gains of something like, you know, 100,000 rupees, a lakh rupees, 5 lakh rupees. Some have even said, you know, a million rupees they have earned because they went to the potential fishing zone and caught the fish. But still, if we kind of made it paid, we would not have kind of, you know, it would not have been successful. I think, you know, the way, way this organization has been sustainable, I mean, let's say, like, if you look at MS Swaminathan Research Foundation, you know, Qualcomm has supported them for about 10 to 12 years now. But given our support for them, they have actually built a very large, I would say, practice around working with fishers, you know. So they, it has helped them, you know, kind of, you know, stay, stay work with INCOIS, get grants from them, uh, get grants from uh, state governments. These grants are not large and you know, uh, luckily for us, uh, both Ashok and Abhishant and you know that some of our non-profit partners actually work with, you know, on a very low cost basis. I don't think that's sustainable because that, you know, prevents them from attracting really good talent. Uh, recently they got a grant from Reliance Foundation to actually work with uh, a fisher women to kind of use technology. So I think these are ways in which they have been sustainable. And I'll take, uh, I'll just take two, three minutes and tell you about another sustainable initiative. So we work, we have worked with Nest, Nextleaf Analytics for about 13 years now. Uh, they started with, you know, clean cook stove monitoring and they found that this technology could be used for vaccine monitoring as well. Uh, you know, they were supported through a lot of grants and BMJF was one. Vodafone Foundation was another, Google was another, and then of course, you know, we funded them to build this new product, which they called CTX, 
and now they are able to actually you know sell it commercially to like now uh, you know uh, i mean the indian government through undp has bought about you know 15000 sensors and they are installing so that has now become you know i would say commercially successful they have a model of you know selling devices and data so even though I, but i think that the bulk of their you know their support has come from philanthropic funding though of course you know as they expand they have their earned media earned revenue which will actually take them forward but i do feel that you know as abhishan touched upon in ashok that they need to be patient capital to fund these initiatives which are actually reaching information to the last man and we know these are valuable so thanks sure. thanks for no thank you and i'll probably just bring out the last question that has come and add one point from my end also to the question and open it up with pranjali and the other panelists that you know there is a question without naming countries that there are different models of uh, using technology for rural development uh being seen across different countries including india and the figures appear to indicate that we've much we've got much to catch up on is the greater emphasis on privacy protection in india and we are talking as the pdp bill is tabled a restricting factor to greater tech intervention for disruption that's the question and uh, seeking the panelists view and i was just going to add that you know uh, i think abhishan had alluded to consent to this particular question i just wanted to also add that that how to your minds uh, does consent work in rural communities if we are being real uh, in this conversation so i'll start with pranjali on your thoughts on some of these points and then we can do a round robin i think anaita it's a very tricky question because uh, on the top level where we are working especially in the healthcare sector right and we really want to say that okay this is phi this is public health information uh, it it doesn't have to reach anything and there's many more aspect to it um i would emphasize on what uh, swapnil mentioned in the earlier uh, section is we somehow are crazy about data these days right we 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 all want the data i don't know like yes data has gravity it has many more use but we somehow wants to cut corner and do that yet we are not really able to make effective use of that so um the question whoever uh, must have asked that i think yes there is a catch in that we are trying we are trying to cut corner we are trying to see that how the, uh, you know all these uh, bills which are passed and we are not collecting the data we are still doing it but we are not able to make use of it effectively and it is stopping us somehow uh, what we need is uh, for this community to be more aware about what we are doing right so sharing the data might not be a problem sharing the right data with the right organization should be a way we should go forward with thanks and uh, here actually it's very interesting that one of our partners uh, nextleaf analytics has uh, you know created some uh, you know really good frameworks on use of data so uh, as you know that they actually collect this data of refrigerators uh, in uh, which helps the community and but they are very conscious about it that the data is owned by the countries and that is something that they keep emphasizing this is something the data sovereignty is something that nextleaf analytics keeps emphasizing uh, the other you know we actually funded a very interesting program in indonesia which actually tracks <coughs> small scale fishing you know we track the coordinates of small scale fishing and this is of course a pilot program that you know which is there uh you know uh, with just about 100 100 uh, fishers in indonesia but this organization that we work with global fishing watch they actually track fishing globally and it's very interesting that if you look at global fishing watch website you can see where fishing is happening and that is because they use you know uh, uh, technologies like ais and i don't want to go into it because it becomes very technical for this audience and that data actually you know vessel wise data is available on their map but this is something which the vessel owners are sharing because of mandates but the small scale uh, fishers they have not given any mandate for sharing their data so that data of course is very restricted it is only used on a need basis and to people who you know the small scale fishers are comfortable sharing data even with fisher friend we actually get data of where the fishers are fishing and this is something which the fishers are not comfortable with 
sharing and we don't share this data you know we are we don't even track the data we don't try to because that would actually give us some really good patterns of where the fishers are fishing but we don't track that data so i think that one has to be very conscious of privacy of you know uh, our communities which are sharing data with us and we need to kind of create those frameworks well, thank, thank you. you so much uh, ashok you over to you for your thoughts yeah so you know sometime back uh, i think i did mention that uh, we have to look at a uh, human centric design principles and uh, whenever we look at the rural setup right each area each um, community or each state has its own regional imbalances so you take even a disability for example you can't say that you know all the people with visual impairment required this solutions it doesn't work so you have to have that particular principle that each one is unique and each one requires its own unique solution for which data is required right and obviously you require technology because keeping the human always in the center you require data while i agree with everybody telling that you have gdpr we have our own government you know data privacy policy coming in but without data meaningful data one can't design a solution for an individual you know um, beneficiary one shirt can't fit all right so that is my you know submission it has to be a um, human centric design principle and i would like to give a nice quote from steve steve jobs what he has written is technology is nothing what's important is that you have faith in people that they are all basically good and smart and if you are giving them tools they will do wonderful things with them and i think that is what is important give them the access the tools and then you will see a difference happen thank you thank you we can't hear you sorry abhishant over to you for your thoughts so thanks um, uh, so from a conclusion point of view what i'll possibly put is is that what is important is uh to do certain meaningful data led interventions at the grassroots level by bringing in three forces one is the grassroots ngo which essentially is the one which has trust of the community second is to build on top of that uh corporate csr which can essentially fund a program and third on top of these two is essentially those like uh, sahmati and uh, i spirit who essentially are in a position to bring data led interventions and fourth on top of that somebody from the tech world who can assemble and make a micro services architecture possible so what you need is to possibly adopt 2 3 4 5 odd villages with a population population in the range of 5 to 10000 you bring all of them together bring up experiment with a population of 40 50 or 1000 and with that population when we when you do these interventions involving all these people and you also involve the local touch points from where data gets originated you involve the local bank you involve uh, the local agent assisted models you involve uh, the local narega databases and others when you bring all of these together and when you bring these volunteer organizations corporate csr to provide sustainable patient capital and when you bring a grassroots ngo along with an i spirit or a sahmati kind of a value chain with a startup willing to experiment on this is when you essentially do a rightful model of deployment on it everything else is a guesswork and is essentially not sustainable in that sense is how possibly i'll put it from a solution thought process point of view no thank you and uh, thank you everybody um i think we started with this and we're ending at it that you know the at the center of it all for the population we are serving deployment of the technology and how that will go about is cornerstone for what we are trying to do i think we already have some of the stakeholders abhishant you mentioned in this room so we can start those conversations right away um but uh, thank you so much for your time and uh, really appreciate everybody for listening in thank you big round